We're pleased uh, to welcome a distinguished panel of experts today uh, on gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender youth issues to First Church, and we're grateful that they've taken the time to volunteer with us. Adolescence can be a very tough time, but what does it mean to be a sexual minority young person? Far too often, when a young person's sexual orientation does not mirror the mainstream, adolescence can turn from difficult to dangerous. Despite significant progress in recent decades, still the statistics surrounding sexual minority youth are alarming. Here are some of those sobering facts. Over 30% of all reported teen suicides each year are committed by gay and lesbian youth. 26% of gay and lesbian youth are forced to leave home because of conflicts regarding their sexual orientation. Approximately 40% of homeless youth are identified as gay, lesbian, and bisexual. Approximately 28% of gay and lesbian youth drop out of high school because of fear or discomfort over verbal or physical abuse in the school environment. And finally, gays and lesbians are at much higher risk than the heterosexual population for drug and alcohol abuse. So how do we create families, faith communities, schools, societies that support young people who may not conform to mainstream norms of sexuality and gender identity? And as members of a socially conscious faith community, such as here at First Church, how can we both individually and collectively help to make a positive difference in the lives of gay and lesbian youth? Well, perhaps today's panel can help, so let me introduce them to you. Starting on my immediate right, um, Don Holt and Sean Simpkins. Don, uh, Don and Sean's son came out over eight years ago at the age of 14. That day changed their lives, and they've been active in the struggle to support equal, equal civil rights for gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender youth ever since. Don and Sean feel that their most important work is in helping other families to successfully navigate the coming out process. Don is currently the president of P-Flag Portland, which meets uh, here at First Church, and uh, Sean manages uh, the chapter's website. Next to them, uh, Joyce Lilleholm, I hope I pronounced that correct. Lilleholm, but we accept anything respectful. <laughs> <laughs> Joyce graduated from Smith College and has a master's uh, in school counseling from Lewis and Clark College. Uh, retired from counseling in the Portland Public Schools, Joyce was an adjunct professor at Lewis and Clark. She has been active as a volunteer both on behalf of sexual minority youth, both in schools and in faith communities. She is a member of the Oregon School Counselor Association the Oregon, um, and the Oregon School Counselor Association. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> Joyce is one of the, also one of the founders of the Oregon Safe Schools and Communities Coalition and serves on their board. Next, Kevin Donegan is a program director at Janus Youth Services. Janus Youth is one of four agencies that serve homeless youth in Multnomah County. Janus works closely with Outside In, New Avenues for Youth, the Native American Youth and Family Association to provide a wide array of services to youth and young adults between the ages of 13 and 25. Kevin grew up in Northwest Montana, graduated from Eastern Montana College where he received a master's degree in counseling. He worked in Central America through the Peace Corps and since 2000 has been program director for homeless youth shelters, street outreach programs, drug and alcohol treatment programs, and transitional housing and independent living programs at Janus. And then finally, Jessica Lee uh, is the queer youth organizer at Basic Rights Oregon. Jessica is a second-generation Korean-American, born and raised in Washington State. She received a Bachelor of Arts from Evergreen State College, where she was a campus organizer for the Women of Color Coalition. She then joined Planned Parenthood of Western Washington, providing community education and clinical assistance for three years. Jessica relocated to Portland and joined Basic Rights Oregon's field team in 2006, where she currently coordinates youth organizing program and alliance building network. Jessica is also an active member of the Oregon Safe Schools and Communities Coalition and the Asian Pacific American Network of Oregon. Let's welcome our panelists to First Church. Well, first of all, I just want to say thank you for having us. We really appreciate the opportunity to talk. And um, because PFLAG, Parents, Families, and Friends of Lesbians and Gays, the Portland chapter um, does me here. I think of this as my home. <laughs> and I think of the room over there as our room, too. So thank you for having us. We really, really appreciate it. So our story is um, probably typical, but probably atypical all at the same time. Um, our son was 14 when he came out. That's still pretty young. Um, and it was, it was pretty much the classic, Mom, I've got something to tell you. Um, and Sean was out of town, I think. It was just me and Christopher at home then. 
Um, and he said to me, Mom, I think I'm gay. And trying to be, you know, the good mom that I am. I said, well, that's okay. That's fine. And he looked at me and he said, well, it may not be a big deal to you, but it's a big deal to me. And I thought, I've blown it. <laughs> I'll go out, come back in, we'll start again. Um, but that was how I found out. And I'm often asked, we're often asked, did you know if Christopher was gay before he told you? And my answer is, actually, no. It hadn't really formulated in my consciousness that my son might be gay. Although. Although. <laughs> It probably should have. <laughs> in retrospect, in retrospect, there were certain signs. Yes. <laughs> Christopher has some little bit of stereotypical stuff. We probably should have thought about it, but it really hadn't. He was still pretty young. Um, and so that, that's you know, sort of the basis of our, of our story. I told Sean when he got home from his trip, and there, there you go. That's how we got started. Um, I think one of the points we wanted to make is that that's really just the beginning. And you know I have no idea how much time I have, so stop me. Okay. Um, that that's really just the beginning. It's when, you, when your child comes out to you, um, that's the beginning of the process. Um, and I think as a family, um, there's then the opportunity to talk about that, to decide what that means to you, to decide how you're going to support your child. But then the next step becomes the coming out process for the family. That's the point I think that PFLAG really works with families. And that's the point that can be a long, if not never ending process. Um, a lot of times when people do come to PFLAG, that's a lot of where their questions are from, is how, how, how do, what do I do now? Now that I know my child is gay, what do I have to do? And the assumption seems to be almost that you have to get out your Rolodex or go through your email um, or Outlook uh, friends group and just tell everybody all at once. And I, I really don't think that needs to be the case. I think it's as the family is comfortable and as things unfold, I think the family kind of naturally and gradually comes out. I don't know if you want to add to that. Well, um, I'd like to present a few words on the dad's perspective. Yeah, that'd be good. Um, as uh, we've gotten more and more involved with um, PFLAG and uh, the movement, uh, a lot of times what we find, or what I've found is, is that sometimes dads tag along behind moms uh, in the entire coming out process and then supporting the child. Other times, uh, dads can actually lead the process. Uh, in our case, and I think one of the reasons why we talked about there were certain there were certain signs when Christopher was younger yeah. that we just simply didn't uh, notice because it really wasn't that important to us. We really didn't think in terms that you might think, okay, this is this is a this is a, a boy, this is a girl, right, you know, right. so forth and so on. It was just simply Christopher was Christopher. Yeah. And uh, one of the things that. I first tried to do, as Don said, was I come from a, a, a profession in which problem solving, identification, and, and solving is is uh, my stock in trade. So instantly, you know, I was trying to say, okay, what do we need to do? What do we need to do? Yeah. How do we solve this? How do we make sure that this is going to be okay for Christopher? How how do we make sure that Christopher is going to grow up to be Christopher and nobody else? <laughs> Uh, not who we wanted him to be, not who anybody else wanted to be, who Christopher wanted to be. And one of the things that we learned very, very quickly was is that Christopher was our guide. Yeah, uh, that uh, Christopher had gone through the same process that we were now embarking on uh, with his coming out that um, he did. And it took a few years although actually it only took about six months for us to start getting really involved. That was our way of supporting Christopher, as well as just simply being good parents to Christopher and making sure that he had um, all the support and love that we as parents could give him. 